Ruby, professional racing driver, is on his way to work. It is May at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, a time of preparing for the richest, most demanding 500 miles in motorsport. Together with Dave Laycock, his longtime friend and chief mechanic, Ruby has been a major factor in many Indy races, but has never won. In 1966 and 1968, he appeared headed for certain victory when his cars broke beneath him. But now it is the racing season again at Indianapolis, and hopefully the time to gain the one triumph that has eluded him for so many years. to the lead is brought to you by Wynn Oil Company, maker of Wynn's car care products that keep your car going strong. Ruby. Indianapolis, 1968. As last year's race moved into its final stages, Lloyd Ruby in car number 25 and carved out a narrow lead over Bobby Unser's Offy and Joe Leonard's turban, and seemed headed for his first 500 victory. He had come from far behind at the start with a brand of masterful driving that has become his trademark at Indy. Then his engine's coil failed, forcing Ruby into the pits. Laycock labored frantically to replace the flawed part but it was too late. Ruby's chance to win flickered away. He sat dejectedly in the car, realizing that he must accept the disappointment of defeat. By the time he re-entered the race, he had to settle for a fifth-place finish. A year has passed since the 1968 disappointment. And Ruby has returned to Indy with the same car, owned by the Gene White Company. It's the Wynn Spitfire, hand-built by Dave Laycock. A strong, simple design fitted with a turbocharged Offenhauser engine developing over 600 horsepower. <laughs> Nearly a month is devoted to practice and qualifying for the 500, and Ruby and Laycock spend long hours at the Bass Track searching for extra speed. Huh. If it gets off turn between eight and nine, it just runs out of air and won't, won't hold that pressure up in there. Well, it might do it up there, but I never did. You uh, said not turn it over, you know, not run yeah, over 24, so after I stood on it once, I sure got it up that way. Well, I put it in fourth and was running around there. Get... See what kind of fuel economy we got, so I can check it to fill it up and run 10 laps and fill it up again. Okay. See if we're in the ballpark with fuel on this thing or not. Ruby runs hundreds of miles in test sessions, which sometimes develop into impromptu races, as is the case when Ruby tangles with Mario Andretti. Smoked this off and went on, didn't he? Fifty-five, thirty. Sixty-two, seven. Huh? Seventy-five. 
Starting near the front of the 33 car field on race day is considered critical at Indy, which forces all the hot shots, including Ruby, to attempt to qualify on the opening day of time trials. White Ruby. But in the early morning practice session, Ruby's engine burns a piston, forcing Laycock and the crew into a frantic rush to install a replacement. While Laycock and the crew work furiously in their garage, other men go about the business of qualifying. A.J. Foyt, seeking his fourth Indianapolis victory, wins the pole position with an average speed of 170.568 miles per hour. Foyt's arch rival, Mario Andretti, records the second fastest time. Third quickest qualifying speed is turned in by last year's winner, Bobby Unser at the wheel of a four-wheel drive Lola. Laycock and his crew manage the impossible. In slightly less than four hours, they put together and bolt in a new engine, literally tightening the last few pieces as the car is placed in line to qualify. We're trying to get up here to qualify, huh? We are starting to push up. They say they're going to go and not going to go. Attention in the pit area. We have a car being presented for qualification. Well, somebody has just hustled the car up here to the line. And it turns out to be Lloyd Ruby at car number four. Lloyd Ruby at car number four. Untuned engine on an oil slick track, Ruby's speed is down, fully four miles an hour slower than the fastest qualifiers. This places him 20th in the field, so far back that some say his disadvantage cannot be overcome. 166.428. By the time the 300,000 race fans crunch their way into the immense track on Memorial Day, Lloyd Ruby's handicap is largely forgotten. He is merely one of 33 brave men to the throng, and it is left to Ruby and Laycock to make their final preparations amidst the hubbub of the starting grid. It's a pit for the, you know, when you want me to come in the pit, give me pit three, pit two, pit one. I'll be in then. They give me three chances to make sure I get the ball. The calls come right in, though. Yeah. Calls it all. We're going to try to come in about 58 to 60 the first time. Yeah. But, uh, give me three laps. That way I'll make sure I don't get the board. The same when you... I'm going to try to save a few on the parade laps. I think you can... Reserve, but... See in the mirror this morning, the thing is smoking a little. We change the pump, it seems to be all right now. It's that gets oil in it. Yeah. And once it gets running, it cleans out. <coughs> it's smoking while running in low gears. I'm gonna keep the RPM up. I guess so. If Ruby is to win, he must charge from the moment the flag falls making a desperate attempt to gain ground on the leaders. No man has started the 500 from as far back as Ruby and still managed to win. In a moment, 
Lloyd Ruby's fantastic charge for the lead at Indianapolis. Once upon a time, there were a bunch of black knights. They gooped up spark plugs, gummed up carburetors, and sludged up PCB smart control valves, robbed cars of pep and power. One day, they heard about a jolly green dragon who could ungoop, ungum, unsludge, and restore pep and power. So, they set out to do him in. The jolly green dragon lived in a can, a can of Spitfire, wind Spitfire. Spitfire is a scientific gasoline treatment that cleans the entire fuel system for better engine performance, better gasoline mileage. The Black Knights fought stubbornly, but before long, they came clean. Wow, Jolly Green Dragon, please stay with us and keep us clean and peppy. And so the dragon did, and they all lived powerfully ever after. The moral of this story is, every thousand miles, put a dragon in your tank. Where you get gas, get Spitfire, made by Wynn Oil Company, the world's leading additive company. Put a dragon in your tank, Spitfire. Starter's green flag waves, and the 53rd running of the 500-mile race is underway. Mario Andretti breaks from his number two starting position and leads Floyd into the first turn, with Bobby Unser close behind. The opening laps of the 500 are among the most hazardous in racing, but the 33-car field stays clear of trouble and streaks after Andretti, who brings his powerful red turbo Ford around to lead the first lap of the race. While the vast crowd follows the duel between Andretti and Foyt, Lloyd Ruby, in the wind Spitfire number four, charges ahead, passing cars with wild abandon. Foyt refuses second place and nails Andretti for the lead. Back, Ruby charges headlong into fifth place with a fantastic display of driving. Trouble on the main straight. Veteran Jim McElreath encounters a fire in the engine compartment of his turbo Wafi, but manages to steer the stricken car out of trouble and jump clear without injury. The track is clear and the battle resumes. Boyd's teammate Roger McCluskey moves up to shove Andretti back to third place. Ruby charges onward, locked in a furious struggle for fifth with Wally Dolan back, who has also started deep in the pack and is charging as hard as the popular Texan. Dolan back leads Ruby briefly but his repass as the pair thunders down in these long backstretch at over 200 miles an hour. Young Gary Bettenhausen, who has been running fourth, falls out with engine trouble, moving Ruby up another spot. Then Roger McCluskey runs short of fuel and posts toward the pits. Ruby advances to third place. The leaders stop simultaneously for fuel at 130 miles. And suddenly, Ruby and the wind Spitfire are in the lead. A.J. Foyt's crew works with perfect precision as they load their boss's car with 75 gallons of fuel and send him on his way in 27 seconds. And 
British crew isn't quite as fast, taking 43 seconds before they can get their car refueled and back onto the track. After leading for less than a lap, Ruby dives into the pits for his first stop. It appears that Ruby has mistaken Laycock's signal that he is in first place for an order to pit for fuel. And after he has been serviced, the crew tries to sort out the reason for the confusion. Point leading, Ruby and Andretti tie into a frantic battle for second place, passing and repassing as they sweep around the giant track. and Andretti catch Boyd on the back straight, and Ruby nips into the lead as they streak toward the third turn. Mario tries to get by two, but Boyd closes the gate. Boyd, his car sputtering fitfully, is unable to hold off the charging Andretti, and soon falls behind the two leaders. A faulty turbocharger will force him into the pits, and finally drop him to eighth in the standing. The race is being run at record speed, and a number of contending cars are falling by the wayside. Shortly after Foyt visits the pits for a lengthy stop, Wally Dolenbach ends a fine race when his car encounters differential failure. But Ruby speeds onward. Having established the lead, he pursued so valiantly in the early stages of the race. If his luck holds, he seems headed for victory. Ruby is running in first place, although Mario Andretti holds tight on his tail in second. The pair have outdistanced the rest of the field and are running at a record pace in a race that is miraculously free of trouble. Then Mario ups his speed and regains the lead from Ruby. Arnie Knepper's car breaks its suspension, sending it into the wall. Knepper brings it to a halt, then bravely stands up in the cockpit to wave his comrades away from the wreck. It is the second and last time the caution flag will be displayed in one of the safest 500s in history. Now Mario leads with Ruby close behind. It appears that Ruby is content to let Andretti set the pace, hoping that he will overstress his engine in the process. Both men have been dogged by bad luck at Indy, and only time will tell if either is in for a change of fortune on this particular afternoon. third, Joe Leonard runs ahead of Dan Gurney, who is holding his ailing eagle in fourth place. 
just past the halfway point in the race. Andretti ducks into the pits for his second routine stop on the 104th lap. He is idled for 36 seconds while fuel is taken aboard. Enough time to permit Ruby to establish a full lap advantage before Mario can get underway again. Soon, Ruby must stop, and Laycock and the wind Spitfire crew have the fueling equipment ready when he rolls into the pit. Ruby's advantage over Andretti is more than one full lap. There are two tanks to fill, and Ruby's earlier stop was 23 seconds, 13 seconds faster than Mario's last stop. Another quick stop will keep him well out in front. Thinking both tanks are full, Ruby pops the clutch and begins to move away. But he starts too soon. A fueling hose is still attached to the car, and the sudden start rips away the tank's coupling. Fuel is spilling out of the ruined car, while the crew looks on in disbelief. After agonizing moments, Ruby is urged out of the cockpit. The impossible has happened. With the car running perfectly, a freakish accident has knocked it out of contention, striking its driver a blow that borders on the unbearable. For the third time in the past four Indianapolis races, Lloyd Ruby has been sidelined while leading and seemingly headed for victory. Wally Dollenbach offers a few words of sympathy, and Ruby turns back to the car as if he's experiencing some absurd nightmare. And another look will find the leak repaired. Riding in first place, takes his helmet off. We know how he feels. The one of the Speedway's greatest drivers. The car is out irrevocably. Fuel, as is shown here in replay, to a cross-up in signal that caused Ruby to move ahead before the hose coupling had been removed. Lloyd Ruby's race is ended. After one of the most courageous and thrilling charges for the lead in 500 history, his luck fails, and he begins the long, despondent walk back to his garage. With Ruby out, the vitality is removed from the race. Mario leads easily, although his car is overheated. Dan Gurney has advanced to second place, but his car is also hindered by a malfunctioning rear suspension. He is unable to challenge the leader. Bobby the answer is moved into third place, despite pitting for seven tire changes. In fact, mechanical problems have crippled much of the field. And as the 500 unwinds into the final lap, only 13 cars are running. Trying to conserve his car, Mario slows his pace to 150 miles per hour fully 15 miles per hour slower than its racing potential. The victory in the 53rd Indianapolis 500 goes to Mario Andretti and what is a relatively easy win. His average speed of 156 miles per hour sets a new record but the final 200 miles following Ruby's mishap had been relatively slow. Otherwise, the closing lap might have included a showdown between Ruby and Andretti. But it was not to be. And one more year must pass before Lloyd Ruby gets another crack at the Indianapolis victory he so richly deserved. The Gene White Company will doubtlessly construct a newer, faster car for Lloyd Ruby, and it will be perfected in a series of punishing tests. Tests intended to produce for Ruby the best possible racing machine to overcome the one major challenge that eludes him. But ultimately, it is up to Ruby himself. It is he who must drive with the skill and determination necessary to win at Indy. And those qualities must be born out of a basic enjoyment of racing, the fierce competition, the satisfaction of controlling an automobile at great speeds, and the deep desire to charge for victory.
Charge to the Lead has been brought to you by Wynn Oil Company, maker of Wynn's car care products that keep your car going strong.